there and oh, I got it. Um, okay, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah, super excited. This is a great room uh, to share the work that I've been growing and thinking about. And I, I have to say that I, I'm the slowest writer ever. So, <laughs> so a lot of what you'll hear today um, is is work that is um, uh, in publication, um, but not. Uh, some of it is not out yet, um, but I'm uh, delighted to share it with you um, and excited to think with you about these sets of ideas. So let me uh, just figure out the screens. Uh, Amy, can you tell me again if I've got the screen right? Uh, let me press play. Looks great. Perfect. Okay, super terrific. All right. Well, first, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, where I live and where I work. I want to acknowledge that I um, live and work on the unceded lands of um, the Kumaya Nation, and I work here mindful of uh, Indigenous peoples uh, past, present, and emerging. So I want to start this talk with uh, my family. Um, Hold on, let me just move the Zoom window. Okay, there we go. Working with two screens. Uh, so my family history is ordinary American history, um, but the, the, the mundane details of my family's journey from slavery to present are what give me purpose, um, what formulate my questions, and what help me imagine the possible. I'm a descendant of slaves. Um, my great-great-grandmother and great-great-grandfather were born slaves in Wernet, Virginia, then emancipated, and they and my great-grands uh, lived on plots of land that were formerly um, you know, parts of the plantation where my great-great-grandparents were enslaved. It wasn't until the Great Migration that my grandfather and his six brothers moved to cities like New York, Baltimore, D.C., Norfolk, Philadelphia, seeking different possibilities and pursuing education and trades. Uh, most of my family came up through the historically back Black colleges and universities, um, and these are consequential institutions of higher education for Black people, um, particularly in the past, but also still um, in the present. And, you know, uh, just for example, my great uncle, which is my grandfather's little brother who just passed last year, um, received his bachelor's and master's in biology in 1951 and 1956, respectively, from an HBCU, then received a PhD in chemistry from Georgetown in 66 and went on to um, become a, a research scientist for the Federal Department of Health and Human Services for the rest of his career just one generation removed from slavery. So this picture is of my grandmother's sixth grade class in 1954 in Norfolk, Virginia. And she also received a bachelor's um, from uh, HBCU from Hampton Institute at the time, but it was, uh, but it's now Hampton University in 1938. And this um, picture is, is meaningful a lot, for a lot of reasons. Uh, she's in the background, if you can see right at the top. Um, but this picture was taken the same year of Brown. Uh, and a lot has changed for us since then. And much of the scholarship on equity in education focuses on the since then. And uh, the since then is dark. Um, the existential reality of education for minoritized children is real dark, so dark that it feels absolutely impossible to even begin to course correct. Um, it's entrenched, it's systemic, it's at the micro level, it's at the meso level, it's at the macro level, it's just too much. Yet I think about revolutionary acts like Frederick Douglass learning how to read and then becoming an abolitionist. And I think about my grandmother's classroom, uh, you know, one of the first public schools uh, to serve Black children in the area. And I think about, you know, the HBCUs and generations of Black people who've come through them. And I think about these things and and I think, okay, we, we're, we're just not being expansive enough. Um, in, in terms of the current um, day status of um, education for minoritized children, we need to think more creatively. 
Um, so uh, this circumstance, I had to, I had to do this. I, I've been thinking about this movie <laughs> for the last couple of days. Uh, but uh, uh, the circumstance, the circumstances we're in, do not have to be the circumstance. And we need to build. We need to imagine more just futures. Um, and, you know, I think uh, this movie is really, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about this with anybody who will entertain me, but I think this, this, this movie or sets of movies are really interesting and subversive, um, possibly the most subversive idea in public discourse on Black existentialism, um, because it, it, it imagines, um, you know, Black excellence and Black, uh, you know, uh, just yeah, uh, it imagines black futures where people are scientists and um, you know creating incredible things. And uh, not that you know black people are scientists and creating incredible things now, but it's 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 a really intriguing contemplation of where we are. Um, so, but back to, back to the talk. Um, so when Booker T. Washington and Du Bois uh, famously deba debated on what education should look like for Black folks post-slavery, they were debating on um, who we could become as free folk and how education, what we learn and, and um, how we learn and to what, what ends could mediate these different possibilities. While this debate is long over. Um, the questions of who we could become as free folk and how education mediates these possibilities are still, I would argue, the key concerns of our day. And not from a philosophical imaginary of these, as these men's, men engaged in at the turn of the century, but because in 2022, we see the consequences of choices on how to educate on the lives of black folk as well as other minoritized children. So, I mean, what happens in the classroom matters for futures. What happens in the classroom matters for just futures. So now I wanna shift to the, the research portion of my talk and um, I, I want us to not only sit with the legacies of this American history um, in classrooms um, of today, um, the classrooms that we've been in as learners, but also the classrooms that serve so many beautiful um, black and brown children today. And I want us to consider what our field, the learning sciences might bring to bear on these issues. Um, many studies focus on things like achievement gaps as existential facts for Black, Indigenous, and children of color. Um, but I, I see them as a consequent of many micro moments of opportunities to learn that are mediated by frameworks about children's capacity to learn, um, to capacity to grow and become. And in my work, I seek to design something simple but complex, which is learning that fundamentally honors the human dignity of black and brown children. Um, the kind of dignity, dignity that was ubiquitous in classrooms, um, you know, like my grandmother's, for example, um, that where each child was positioned as able. Um, and to use the language of my dear colleague, Macy, each child was positioned as beautiful um, and the uh, capability of learning and becoming whatever they wanted to be uh, and capable of uh, learning and becoming whatever they wanted to be. So I wanna offer us a concept that I'm referring to as equitable rationality to think with, to design with and to evaluate the consequences of teaching that serves children of color. And by equitable rationality, it feels like a bit of a clumsy term, but it really captures what I mean, um, which is uh, teachers' ways of thinking and doing in teaching practice that are fundamentally rational schemas, um, where rationality is rooted in connected logics of dignity, beauty, and assets for human development. In other words, expressions of anti-racist praxis. So um, 
In order to um, move further, I want to orient here around uh, the kind of work that I do, um, which is about classroom interactions, such as this one. And this is one of my favorite little bits of transcript. It's just such a, a, a beautiful little um, you know, moment or dialogic spell, as my uh, my colleague calls it. Um, so this is a classroom where um, a, a high school uh, biology classroom, and what they're doing here is they're interpreting this um, uh, pedigreed chart of the Romanov family. Um, and uh, the teacher asks them what these halfway shaded circles are. And so this is a, a pedigree chart of how the Romanov family um, uh, of genetic inheritance, inheritance of hemophilia in the Romanov family. So this is from BSCS uh, biology curriculum. So, um, so the teacher asks the students, what do, what do the halfway shaded circles mean? And, and then Dante says it's females that are affected. Uh, Kendra says it's the girls that got it. Elijah says it's the girls that carry it. Cassandra says it's the girls that carry it, but they don't have it. And then, um, Mr. Anderson says, the girls, do they have the disease? Um, and then uh, Kendra says, yes. Uh, Ashley says, no, they just carry it. And Jamisha says, no, they just carried it and pass it on. So this is just uh, what I what I like about this um, segment of discussion is it's a really, um, uh, it, to me, elegant moment of elaboration. And in order to elaborate, um, as each kid is elaborating on, on another kid's thinking, um, they have to recognize not only um, their understanding, but um, someone else's understanding um, as voiced through their um, you know, utterance. And they have to understand the distance between their own understanding and their peers' understanding and verbalize that difference. And that's exactly what's happening you know, in these moments till we get to a more refined um, um, uh, explanation at the end. And I think uh, what, what is really, um, uh, or at least what I want you to attend to for the moment is just really what the teacher's role in, in facilitating this is. Um, teachers, questions carry with them a socio-cognitive implicature, uh, which is by virtue of asking questions, it prompts a kind of thinking that is required to answer the question. And this is consequential for the, the discourse culture of classrooms. So um, for example, if it's a classroom with an IRE um, a kind of uh, a discourse structure, it, the, the cognitive, and sociocognitive implicature is pretty um, thin. Um, you know, effectively, a teacher is asking for a correct answer that um, you know aligns with an expectation. Whereas in um, classrooms that are really um, you know dialogic um, classrooms, the the sociocognitive implicature is is that effectively we're reasoning in order to answer questions, and and. And the socio part is that we're reasoning together. We're reasoning on each other's reasoning. Um, so in my work, I've been studying teachers' facilitations of science discussions and thinking about how do we design for these kinds of um, discussions so that students have opportunities to learn and engage with science. But um, I wanna show you this quote real quick before we continue. Um, <clears throat> this is a quote from a teacher um, in a study that I was um, postdoc on, um, and uh, this was um, uh, on this study of accountable talk, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. And uh, uh, I was interviewing this teacher about her facilitation of accountable talk, and she says this, my kids could totally uh, do this, meaning engage in science argumentation. But these kids, uh, these kids have low reading ability, behavioral issues. There are a lot of absentees. Each day you're teaching a different group of kids. So they're just really dis disruptive. Now, hang on a sec. I just want us to sit with the pronouns for a sec. Um, it wasn't until I heard this teacher say these that I understood what she meant by my. Um, but ironically, these kids and my kids have the same tuition. 
this teacher. So these kids may be her biological, I mean, my kids may be her biological children, but these kids are the kids that she's teaching and they have the same tuition, her. Um, and I think, you know, this, this formulation is fundamentally a misapprehension of the charge of teaching to support human development. So how do we make sense of data like this? This is what I've been trying to, to do over the last decade. How do we make sense of this as a social process, as a, of, you know, um, of teachers engaging in a social process, as teachers developmental process, but also as a cultural artifact. And what does that mean for how do we design um, teacher learning to disrupt frames such as these? So um, I wanna situate this, um, uh, or at least my own thinking um, in a framework that has guided uh, uh, my design work, um, which is a Clark and Hollingworth, Hollingsworth's uh, interconnected model of teacher growth. And um, you all may be familiar with this. I'll, I'll, I'll do broad brushstrokes um, just to highlight the, 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 the most salient aspects of this model. Um, what was key to this model is it's dynamic. And so we're thinking about teacher learning as nonlinear. Um, as an interaction between um, professional development, which is the external domain, um, practice, um, which is experimentation in the classroom, um, you know, teaching, in other words, um, uh, salient outcomes, which are, you know, what happens when you do particular instructional moves, what happens um, when, when um, in terms of what, um, what you see, in um, students' uh, engagement in learning. And then the personal domain, which is um, a teacher's knowledge, beliefs, and attitudes. And so what they argue through a series of, um, and this model comes from a series of empirical studies, um, was that there is this dynamic interact interaction between these domains. And so in my work, I've been thinking about this um, in terms of how do we design teacher learning? Um, how do we sort of pull on the strings of this model to think about um, you know, designs that can support teachers' growth? But in particular, I think we need to think about teachers' growth as nested um, in social and mediated processes and ways of knowing that serve social reproduction. So this is... Um, if we take this back to the teacher um, and the quote a moment ago, um, we could think about um, her quote in um, really kind of stark, um, you know, um, simplified ways like, oh, okay, you know, she's a jerk. Oh, okay. Um, you know, she, she, she's racist, you know, oh, okay. But the world is not that simple. Um, and so, how do we think about um, you know, her statement as a reflection of the social systems in which she is embedded within that shape ways of seeing certain kids? Um, and how do we um, sort of use this, this kind of framing to think about design, um, to think about the possibility of moving people um, from frameworks that are uh, fundamentally deficit oriented towards frameworks that embody um, equitable rationality. And so um, uh, I wanna run through a series of, of talks in, in, in a kind of um, uh, Hansel and Gretel uh, sort of breadcrumb <laughs> collection um, that really, uh, you know, it's hard with, with giving these kinds of talks to, to choose because everything that I've done is connected. Um, and each study is trying to um, solve problems uh, that, you know, a previous study, um, you know, had in terms of assumptions and, and things like that. Um, so I feel like I might be trying to cover way too much territory, but um, bear with me. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I want to, I want to walk through these, um, these, these, um, a set of, uh, investigations that shape my thinking, 
um, and collect these breadcrumbs um, and um, hopefully not get to a, a big bad wolf, but really get to more precision in defining the problem uh, that really um, should guide how we design teacher learning, right? Um, so using uh, Sandoval's um, uh, conjecture mapping framework, um, I'm going to walk through these studies and sort of highlight these different aspects of, um, of my design conjectures uh, in order to figure out how do we design for teacher learning to embody equitable rationality. And so high level conjecture, I'm sure most of the people in this room are, um, are familiar with this model, um, but, but really um, one way to think about it is, is a logic model for how we design. And um, we start with a high uh, level conjecture that is a theoretically, theoretically principled idea for how we want to um, support learning. And then we have its embodiments, like how we actually, um, you know, a structure or design a learning environment to support certain outcomes. And then we have mediational processes that are, you know, a mediation and a sort of activity system or, um, you know, Vygotskyan um, way where what are the, what are the things that actually are mediating um, uh, maybe teachers uh, thinking and, and that relates to the outcomes of an intervention. And then the outcomes are our intended outcomes, right? So I want to start um, um, with uh, the, the Accountable Talk and, and High School Science project um, that I was involved in in Pittsburgh. And really, we, we started with the, uh, 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 the conjecture that a teachers engaged in um, content fo focused coaching, um, you know, on Accountable Talk, you know, um, which uh, you know it it would support their learning of accountable talk and therefore their teaching of accountable talk, and so really um, what this looked like was side by side coaching, um, you know, of instructional moves, and and for those of you that are not aren't familiar, accountable talk is really a taxonomy of moves that comes from the study of what um, really um, you know master teachers do. Um, in uh, or expert teachers, I uh, use better language. Um, but uh, what what expert teachers have been uh, uh, shown to do that elicits something magical in kids in terms of discursive reasoning and, and thinking. And so um, you know this conjecture, you know, uh, in in this work, we we tried to support teachers in learning accountable talk through content focus coaching and lesson planning and really participating in um, accountable talks discussions as as a student themselves. Um, and um, let me show you some things that we found. Um, so this is uh, uh, um, some data from a three year study of this one teacher. Um, and I chose him as a critical case because um, when we went into his classroom in year three, um, it was drastically different um, from year two and year one. And we didn't even have to analyze the data to know that. And so I was like, oh, okay, let's look at um, what's happening. And this is my naive Sharif. Oh, okay, let's look at what's happening uh, in terms of how this teacher is growing and, 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 and look at you know, how their facilitation is becoming um, more nuanced over time, right? And so did a couple of things, he's growth modeling and all sorts of fancy things. Um, and, then, uh, and then what I did was I looked at, um, you know, um, so oh, sorry, just to give you some insight of the data sources. Um, uh, this teacher participated in five workshops in year one, seven coaching cycles in year um, two, and, and no PD in year three. Um, and uh, in year one, he taught a lower track um, biology classes in year one and year two, low track, and uh, in year three, um, intermediate. Right. So um, we had 70 um, uh, observations of this teacher over three years, it's a little, huge data set of a single teacher, which I thought was awesome, you know, because it would allow me to like crawl over these years of um, data and really look at how his, you know, schemas for um, accountable talk are changing through practice. Right. Sure he's talking. Uh, <laughs> 
So, um, so yeah, we have pre post interviews in year one and year two. All right. So uh, I can I can talk more about the analyses um, uh, uh, if you want, but I'll just show you some uh, findings. So if we looked at his classroom, this is observation. Five and year one. Um, this uh, he, this is a sociogram of the interaction in terms of who's talking to whom, and so we see Mr. Nelson, the teacher, is central, um, and all the convers all the talk in the discussion is going through him. So he asks a question, student answer, and um, and then he uh, ratifies that answer, um, very IRE. Um, in year three, we see this really rich dynamic um sociogram uh and you know students are talking to each other they're reasoning about each other's thinking and it is just magic um and then um and we actually break this down a little further in terms of the kinds of ways in which um uh the the utterances are are positioning knowledge and reasoning in the discussions we see in year one um the teacher is primarily, these are the teacher's moves, sorry. Um, the teacher is primarily um, just giving scientific facts, giving scientific explanations as indicated by um, the red bar um, under year one. Um, and the, the, the orange one is, is really when he's listening um, scientific reasoning. Um, and if we jump over to year three, we see, um, he decreases in, in you know, his um, scientific fact giving, as it were, and then he, we see an increase in him uh, eliciting students' um, scientific reasoning. And so um, it's just really interesting. It's like, great. Um, but when we look at his um, interviews, um, we see something else, right? Um, and so... Uh, in year one, for example, he says, um, a, good, a good discussion is where students talk to each other um, and they take the reins of discussion rather uh, than me having to prompt. Um, and we're nowhere near that yet. In year three, he says, um, because they hear a little bit um, here and there and they come with all these misconceptions and, and, and that's what I wanted to touch upon. Accountable talk helps me identify misconceptions because they're, they're brought out and um, if they're brought out, you can address them. Uh, whereas if I'm talking and giving lectures, uh, you know, and taking notes, misconceptions don't come out there. So there, I find, you know, he's saying that I find accountable talk really valuable because it helps to surface students' misconceptions. Um, but we also see this. Um, so uh, he says, so there've been a, a, a little bit of um, pushback, a little bit of a problem for me managing them meaning the students, um, you know, the other classes are, are um, typical mainstream classes. Um, a lot of them have low reading abilities by, by tests and so, so uh, we have to work with them and, you know, trying to help them read. And uh, the book is very hard and, um, and the readings, it's, it's a challenge. So ninth graders like to talk a lot. Um, so that's a challenge because when they're talking, they're not listening. And then in year three, we see him say, um, you know, it works better, meaning accountable talk, um, with the medium and advanced students, lower level classes. Um, you know, I'm no expert in analyzing these kids, but um, I, it's, I, but I, it's, I think that's, um, uh, it, it should be, it seems to me that um, with the lower level kids, a couple of things. One thing is self-discipline. They don't have the self-discipline. They go off task really quickly. And um, number two, attention spans. Attention spans are very short. And so uh, to keep them on topic and to try and get them to go into a deep, uh, deeper into a topic is much more of a challenge. Third, if you have a discussion and you have um, and you have to know a few, you have to know a few things. You have to have some background in knowledge. You have to 
um, have, uh, or search maybe, sorry, I'm <laughs> losing track of my reading. Uh, you have to have some background knowledge and you have to maybe have read something. And a lot of these lower kids have difficulty reading. So um, they don't read a whole lot. Uh, they don't read independently at all. And so, um, the, the you know, that those are the obstacles. So we see a lot of the language, or we, I'm sure you, um, this example helps you see um, some of the similar surface features of uh, the quote that I showed earlier um, uh, from another teacher. Um, but what we see here is this kind of deficit ideology um, about the kids. Um, and again, uh, a sort of um, uh, maybe um, the notion of human development as part of um, the job of teaching, not really part of this, this uh, uh, example. But I think what, what troubled me about this data was that, um, just to go back here for a moment, um, you know, all of these things that I saw in this data was what the teacher could do. Um, and I have serious questions about whether or not the teacher could do these things in uh, year one, um, or whether the teacher chose not to do them. Um, and that is an empirical question. Um, so just to go back here, what do we find? Um, okay, so maybe mediating processes are beliefs about kids' capacity to learn. Um, and you know, effectively what what the outcomes were were selective attention. Um, or sorry, it's selective facilitation of academically rigorous science discussion. Um, so okay, what do we do with that? So Next, and I'm aware of time, so this is classic Sharia's problem. All right, uh, I'll, I'll try and move a little more quickly. Um, but the next, um, the next project um, was a project called Talkways, um, and what I was doing in this project was trying to um, really open up the black box on teacher sense making about students' contributions in science. How can we understand what teachers hear, how, how they see? Um, and then how can we use those insights to design for teacher learning? And the high level conjecture was that, you know, um, teachers learning is part of a complex system uh, drawing on the Hawk, Clark and Hollingsworth uh, model. And so um, really what we did was um, we took uh, segments of discussion from the previous study um, that Mr. actually from Mr. Nelson's class. Um, and we um, sampled segments of discussion that were really rich in terms of um, lots of student um, explanation, lots of disagreement, um, which means lots more explanation because students are, are having to explain why they disagree um, with each other. And uh, we, we, um, we tried to preserve the complexity of these uh, moments of discussion. So effectively what we did was created a, a sort of online survey where um, that was populated with these segments of discussions where teachers listened to the audio. And what we were trying to do is trace the schemas and heuristics that teachers were using to interpret students' ideation in these um, discussions. Um, and they were all focused on the um, same topic so we can try and figure out, you know, how teachers were operating on the content, how they were operating on students' ideation in the content, how they were operating on their own uh, pedagogical repertoires with that content, um, and, um, and so on and so forth. So in the discussions, we had different segments with focal youth. Um, and we asked them, you know, a series of questions, which were like, um, you know, what did you, and what did you um, understand by what, you know, a student said? Um, what do you think they understand? And um, what do you think is happening in the discussion? And how would you facilitate it if, you know, what would you do next if you were facilitating the discussion? Because each one of these segments um, was chosen because it required some sort of pedagogical intervention. It's either that, you know, there was a misconception on the table or that, um, 
uh, maybe this the discussion was going going perfectly smoothly, but then as a facilitator of that discussion, well, how do you then, um, you know, um, really uh, shape the, the the learning conversation? So we wanted to see how they were um, uh, responding to these moments, um, and I want to draw us to a particular um, uh, discussion that segment that we had um, teachers listen to. And um, um, really, um, uh, you don't have to read this transcript and I'm happy to share the slides with you later, but I'll just explain briefly that all that happens in this segment is that um, uh, this, a kid named Shamika asks um, for a clarification. And that's that's really all that's happening, and and uh, and the teacher um, is is um, you know facilitating the student things. So we asked teachers um, who participate in the survey, and there were um, I believe twenty four, um, and um, what do they understand by this? And what we saw was interesting. Um, we're effectively in our analysis looking at how what they say about. Um, a discussion points to um, what actually was said in the discussion and really trying to draw those connections um, and help us understand how teachers make sense of, um, you know, uh, students' ideation when they're listening to discussions. And um, let me just jump here. Um, so we, we, or actually, let me jump here. This is probably better. Um, so what we saw was that um, effectively students, uh, sorry, teachers were making really deficit oriented um, attributions about um, this particular kid's um, thinking um, based on just asking for clarification. Um, and uh, when we looked at their instructional decisions um, on the right, uh, we were looking at, you know, okay, so in, in what ways does, you know, uh, does the teacher really want, um, you know, um, think about uh, pursuing um, maybe a student's questions, uh, you know, so we were really coding for whether or not the, uh, or the ways in which the, the teacher saw those ideas as worthy of pursuit. Um, and so what we saw was that, you know, effectively there were these deficit frames and, um, you know, um, you know, there, 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 and teachers moves, instructional moves were, you know, really move on um, or, you know, ask somebody else or this, that, and the other, but not really think about how you actually um, facilitate this particular kid's thinking. So, I mean, if we go back here, um, we can think about, you know, all right, what did we find in, in terms of embodiment? Maybe we need to design to help teachers attend to the brilliance of student thinking and to be able to see that brilliance. And then, you know, maybe potential um, intervention outcomes could be that, they, you know, as a consequence of seeing that brilliance, um, they're facilitating academically rigorous science discussions. So that is, um, you know, the, the question that guides the next um, set of studies, um, which is uh, Class Insight and uh, a new project where we're, you know, or I am um, building on that work. And uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here because I want to, um, without introducing too many new things, I want to make sure we have enough time to talk. Um, but really, um, the, the main thing about Class Insight was how do we create teacher analytics to help teachers attend to and see um, how they are um, uh, facilitating science discussions and how... Um, what they do in science discussions have particular consequences on what students are doing. Um, and so um, we you know, create these analytics so they can see these interactions. Um, and really what we're trying to do um, with that project, which is winding down now, um, is really see how through this process of reflecting on analytics, teachers are building practical, practical theories, building theories about practice from their own practice that are fundamentally, um, you know, helping them to make sense of 
the ways in which their moves are consequential. Um, consequential in terms of, you know, theoretical features of uh, discussion, um, such as like reasoning and, and, and explanation, et cetera. Um, and um, I am happy to tell you more about um, where this work is going, but I, I, I'll just, um, I want us to stop here. Um, and I, I want to end um, on, on this quote. Um, and just kind of a, um, a provocation that Wakanda doesn't have to be sci-fi. Um, you know, we can we can be truly vis visionary, but um, to use the words of Hooks, but we have to wrestle wrestle with um, you know the you know the the concrete reality of the present to, in order to imagine different possibilities. So I just want to acknowledge my wonderful laboratory. Um, and um, I'm happy to, um, yeah, answer questions. I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen so I can see everybody. I can't see anything. Um, Janae, you can hear me, right? Uh, yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was just brilliant. Loved it. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions from people in the room and people online. Um, I, I just either raise your hands or put them, uh, put the question in the chat. You have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Danielle has a question. Hi, Dr. Clark. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I just have a quick clarifying question. Um, I'm in the process of also um, analyzing transcripts and seeing kind of the different moves that teachers are doing to support students, but in a very different context. Um, but I was just curious, you shared a transcript where um, students were figuring out what the half circles meant. And I was just curious how you'd coded that. Did you look at the data and see what emerged? Did you use a framework? I was just interested more about that. Yeah, so in, in that project, what we were doing was looking at um, um, effectively, you know, how much accountable talk, you know, emerged from those discussions. And so um, we were um, coding for accountable talk moves. But um, in trying to make sense of, um, so that that little segment of data comes from the data that I also showed you on Mr. Nelson. So um, that uh, that was a different teacher, but effectively the same, uh, you know, larger project. Um, and so, you know, in that coding, what I was doing was um, uh, looking at uh, using systemic functional linguistics to look at the ways in which um, students were being um, positioned as knowers in the uh, discussions. And so the, the kind of rationale for that particular coding was really trying to look at um, what proto accountable talk might look like, you know, so um, how can we sort of, you know, reduce um, the sort of complexity, which I think um, accountable talk is really high inference set of, um, of, of uh, moves that you pretty much see what in, you know, expert teachers classrooms, but when you're looking at maybe a teacher growing in this practice, really hard to find any of these things. And then you just have a transcript that, with no coding, you know, so, so, so how can we actually look at these moves in terms of, you know, the ways in which knowledge and ideas are being positioned and how kids are being positioned as knowers. So that was what I did um, in that one, if that helps. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you so much. And good luck with the rest of your research. Okay, I love when you ended on appreciating the brilliance of children. That was, that really hit home. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions in the room or online? I, I, I have a question. So I think, so this is fascinating and, um, and in thinking about what you're trying to do, so accountable talk, and I am familiar with accountable talk to an extent, but um, it doesn't really take power into account 
per se, does it? I mean, does it, it doesn't really look at necessarily sort of taking a, a, a hard lens of, of seeing who's from the children's perspective in terms of status and who and how they're interacting with each other and with the teacher in that. Is, is that true or not? And if it is true, how are you thinking about that? Like what, what have, how are you picking that up? Because it seems that you're absolutely picking that up in the, in the analysis, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was something I was, I was really interested in. Um, and um, that is work that I've published. <laughs> you know, like, so I'm just like, I feel bad. I'm like, these are all the things I'm writing. Um, so, but, uh, but yeah. Um, so really what I was interested in was uh, trying to figure out like who talks and what, you know, um, how, um, you know, how do kids, uh, you know, really um, navigate into um, the discursive floor. Um, and uh, I found a, a few things, uh, which is that uh, uh, one who talks is uh, the same four kids, right? You might have a classroom of 20 and same four kids. Um, if a teacher is not being intentional about how um, they are, you know, facilitating the discussion to make the discussion more equitable. Um, and that um, really you have um, this thing that happens where a teacher is, is, is shopping for the, the right answer. Um, this is, you know, at least in the, in the studies that I have studied um, and the data that I've studied um, where they are looking for the right answer. So they're asking a kid that they, you know, uh, that they think knows the answer. So a kid who answers a lot is a heuristic for, you know, they will have the right answer. And, and the, the, the conversation isn't about sense-making, it's about shopping for that right answer. So, I mean, in, uh, in you know, in all of my work, I've been trying to um, figure out how do we, how do we sort of um, decompose that? Um, and how do we help teachers to think differently about um, how they facilitate a discussion in ways that um, really are attending to those power dynamics and 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 uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thank you. You read up on your stuff more. <laughs> do you have a yeah. question? Yes. So, go ahead. Um, uh, hi, Dr. Siris Clark. Hi, Siga. This was a fantastic talk and, and very inspiring work. Um, uh, could you say a little bit more uh, about, um, so, so you have this um, analysis of, of teachers' uh, linguistic and facilitation practices sort of having um, an identifying deficit orientations uh, as they, they um, uh, they, they teach, and I have been sort of wrestling with this for the last few years, which is when we work with teachers, how as researchers we sort of check our deficit orientations with teaching practice, you know, so, so as we want teachers to notice their deficit orientations about uh, student uh, in, uh, participation, how do we sort of check our mm -hmm. deficit orientation? This is a great question. This is a really great question. Um, and this is something that we in my group have been really, um, you know, constantly doing a sort of like a check in about like, hang on, hang on, hang on. You know, in what ways are we thinking about teachers in deficit oriented ways? Um, and one of the papers that we're writing right now, um, working title is Anti-Racism as Developmental. Uh, what we're thinking about is really how do teachers grow in these practices? And I think just the frame that this is a developmental process helps to do some of that checking in, you know, like, hang on, hang on, hang on. How do we see this as processual? Um, and um, in the class insight work, uh, one of the things that I 
I didn't show, but we we were doing was we we started thinking about how um, you know when we were having teachers reflect on analytics, like each one of these reflections was a bit disembodied, and so we were like, how do we help teachers sort of you know, we need some sort of substrate. We need to tether these reflections so that they continue to grow and build on each other, right? And so we developed this 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 um, uh, sort of analytic, which we're talk, talk, calling a schema. Uh, and one of the aspects of the schema, which is their own thinking that we just tie the reflections to each time. Um, the One of the things about the schema is um, really their schema about equity. And we struggled with this one because when we're asking teachers, you know, to sort of explicate what they think about equity, you know, and sometimes, you know, what they say is a bit equity light. And we're like, yo, like, but we're in partnership. And so how do we actually navigate those research relationships and, and treat, you know, the teachers we work with as, um, as you know, in the ways that we want you know kids to be uh, treated, and so how do we how do we navigate this development where we want teachers to develop more complex frames about equity? We want them to develop more justice oriented frames about equity that maybe um, look like you know the kind that we have had because we've been in conversation about these ideas and you know pouring over data for so long. But but how we do that has to be incremental, you know, and it has to attend to where teachers are and it has to have an understanding that teachers can grow. Yeah, hi, hi Trisha, uh, Trisha Tomer here. Um, thank you so much for this. It was hi, true. Hey, so one question. In all this work, have you noticed any patterns or anything where you walk in and um, there are certain characteristics of the teachers, backgrounds, training, attitudes, which facilitate or even inhibit the uptake of what you're trying to do? Mm, um. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got a lot of conjectures. Um, I think that um, some of it comes from, well, I think it's it's a complex answer. I think it's, I think, uh, it's a complex answer. And I think that um, a lot of it happens to be, um, at least from what we're seeing is, comes from some of the pace of, of schools. Like, you know, oh, okay, we have to, you know, do these things, we have to, you know, go through these tests. And so in a way, these things are pulling teachers away from, you know, really sort of wrestling with, you know, my kids as humans. Um, so I think that's, that's one, um, you know, set of things. Um, I think uh, the other is, is, um, a willingness to engage in um, uh, really looking at oneself in the mirror. I think that would probably be a big one out there um, because we definitely have teachers who engage in these processes and we've worked with them for five years and it seems like we never sort of penetrate you know, we never sort of get in. And when you look at, you know, everything they say in the reflective sessions and everything they say, or, you know, these are the the, the reflections with analytics. And um, when you look at what they say in interviews, they seem to be always talking about somebody else and, 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 and never really looking at themselves. And so I would say that would be a big thing too. Thank you. Um, any questions from online? I want to make sure that we give um, people who are online a chance as well. Just raise your hand. I think we've taken a minute or two for one last question from online, if, if anyone has it. Got to give time.
Um, all right, this is it. Oh, wait. Okay. Oh, Rishi. Bye, Rishi. Good to see you. Um, yeah. Well, I am happy to. If anybody has any brewing questions, um, you know, after this, happy to talk. Um, and yeah, this was probably way too ambitious to try to cover all these things, but I'm so happy to share this work um, with you all. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Been really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of things to think about uh and thank you for sharing and your offering just uh as she put it and um next week i just want to put in uh what we are we don't have a from uh, lunch and learn next week because of thanksgiving but afterwards we have i think is it true i think it's true and Brittany. no i think we're the week after that or the week after. I don't remember. I should have checked. What was that? What was that? Um, uh, Rosa Jimenez. Ah, uh, Rosa Jimenez. Okay. So, so please do join us after Thanksgiving for another wonderful talk. And thank you again, Dr. Cherise Clark, uh, for joining us and sharing your work. Much appreciated. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And bye, everyone. Have a happy day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.